is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Dark, Season 1, Episode 6. Six Sic Mundus Creatus Est. Right? In this episode, there are a lot of reveals made. But the biggest one is probably that we have found Mads. Ulrich knows. He doesn't know how. He doesn't know why. But he knows. Ulrich also found out that the girl that he has been having an affair with is the one who turned him in falsely on charges of rape. Ulrich's having a really bad day, is what I'm saying. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. Thank you so much to Jill for commissioning this episode. I haven't covered Dark since July at this point. And I got to tell you guys, it feels like it's been two weeks. It's like, I don't know how this month has passed so quickly, but it doesn't feel like a month and two weeks, three weeks at all, at all to me. And I went and rewatched the previous three episodes to this one before I um, watched this one yesterday. And I've been trying to get Owen to watch, but we have not had consistent time. Um, and we, I can't, there was nothing in the rewatch that I didn't fully remember. So I want you all to know that I'm coming into this feeling pretty confident. Like, I feel like I am still on top of things here. Um, this episode is so bonkers. And I was so mad because I first watched it that the day of the last recording, which was, I think, July 23rd or something like that. And that day when I realized that it was going to be so long until I finally got to talk about it, I was so bummed out because so much happens here. I first of all, want to start off with the opening of this episode in which we see Regina and she has like paint on her face, the way that you would wear to maybe like a football game or something, except they don't have that kind of football here. So I don't know, but she is tied to a tree in the woods and she is calling for, uh, Catherine, Katharina, is it Katharina? Um, or Ulrich. And she is panicking and getting really agitated, trying to untie herself from this tree. And she starts yelling help. And there's a bunch of stuff like at her feet, I guess a backpack and whatnot. She is starting to really think that maybe there is somebody out here with her. She keeps hearing something. And the camera at one point trains on the mouth of the cave and there is a real noise coming from there that, I mean, I'm a viewer sitting in the safety of my living room on my couch. And that sound for me is utterly terrifying. If I were in the woods tied to a tree alone in front of the mouth of a cave, that sound was coming out of my insides would liquefy. I would piss and shit myself and be a mess. I would just lose it. And she's screaming. And then all of a sudden, Regina in the present day wakes up in like a cold sweat, clearly flipped out from a recurring dream of something that had happened to her. Now, I want to say this as much as I say, I would piss and shit myself and lose my mind. It's totally does not excuse the way that Regina behaves later this episode. And I am not sorry that Katharina kicks her ass at all. Not even a little bit. Like, I want to have sympathy for this woman. And the instant that I start to feel that, she rips it away with her shit attitude and her, like, 
uh, just the way that she is with people. And it's really difficult for me to like give a shit about something bad happening to her. Like for a moment I care and then it's gone. Um, so anyway, that is, you know, her yelling for Ulrich and Katharina, it's clearly them who tied her to that tree and she has not forgiven them for that. And he is, when he talks to her later, pretty much unrepentant about it. He just seems to not understand why it's bo- it still bothers her so much to this day, what happened. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, so sic mundus creatus est, I looked up what this meant and then I immediately forgot. So let's see, sic mundus creatus est meaning Latin term, which means thus the world was created. Okay. Gotcha. Um, and we get this like, you know, kind of summary of what's going on with missing children one boy dead. Um, and Charlotte is really being very insistent at this point that like, we have got to start pushing it a little bit here. We need to widen the search. We need to knock on every door. We need to search every basement. There is no way that this boy disappeared in such a small town and nobody saw anything. And we get a, I find a pretty like chilling shot of a residential street. Um, and there is just like, it's papered with flyers. And this is one of those things that um, I feel really like, is it worth it to be putting this many flyers up this close together? Is this effective? But it's definitely effective imagery, you know, So seeing all of these spread out, um, but yeah, she is just not feeling like they have done everything they can. She's like, I want to question absolutely everyone. And I feel like Ulrich last episode, he really kind of lashed out at her, um, you know, talking about how this is his kid and she just doesn't get it. But now her daughter almost vanished and encountered somebody who is obviously really like questionable. And she is feeling a little bit more pressure now, like understanding just what it was that he is going through and what other parents are going through. Um, you know, and having another kid vanish. Somebody must have seen something. Coordinate with other departments in the district. I want you to search the archives for similar cases in and around Winden over the last 50 years. Even if a child went missing for just 24 hours, I want to know. I want you all working double shifts. Leave no stone left unturned in this town. So I can really get behind this. I think this is the right way to handle it. And I'm also excited about her deciding to go back in the archives 50 years because I would prefer that she go back in the archives 66 years, considering that she said something about the 33 year cycle. Um, But I understand choosing a round number like 50, it's still going to turn some things up. So um, yeah, she is just convinced that we have to find some trace somewhere. And as she says this, the camera zeroes in on uh, the face of Ulrich's son in a school photo from the 80s. Mikkel. Guys, I cannot. Like, he's right there. And it's so obvious why they have not found him there. They have not noticed him there. Why the fuck would they notice him? But, oh my God, it's so insane and so infuriating. And are they going to figure this out? Like, is anybody going to notice this? Like, a kid that disappears is going to be on record. A kid that appears, apparently from nowhere, does that go on record anywhere? Like, what do you file that under what sort of police report is that a minor discovered alone 
with no uh, like apparent family anywhere does that because we know he talked to Egon the um the he- chief of police at the time so is that in the records did they take a photo of Mikkel and put that in like is that something that is even available for Ulrich to find I don't know how that works you know I would imagine when you find a child you assume that their family is going to reach out looking for that child. So you won't be making the same kind of like file for him because you think that this is just a kid that got lost. It's not like a case, you know? So I wouldn't be surprised if there's nothing really specific about it written anywhere. Um, who fucking knows? I'm just dying here. We got a bunch of people in the chat. Hi, Nicola. Hi, Jesse. And Rashawn is here. Hello. Um, so yeah, this zeroing in on this photo just fucked me up. Um, and we go from this photo to Jonas asking Hannah, how did you and dad meet? Um, and she says in the hospital, he had a broken leg, which I didn't remember him having a broken leg. Is that true? But, yeah, she says that I was in a bad mood, which we know is true. Um, And he asks her, like, what was he like? And she says, you never knew whether he took something seriously or not. He was very different. And she that that is a really weird thing to say. Is that just me? Like, when you're talking to your son about what your kid... What, what your kid's father was like before he started to deal with mental illness, the, the way, and I mean, guys, let's talk about what that must be like. If you are Mickle, if you vanished without any sort of explanation and wound up 30 years in the past and you grow up and you begin to approach the date at which you disappeared and the overlap of you existing and the birth of your young self. So you are existing in the town with the younger version of yourself. Yeah, I think you'd start struggling with a little mental illness. I guess you would, wouldn't you? Like, how fucked up is that? Oh my God, I just couldn't. That's just messed up. That's a messed up situation. And I really feel for the guy when I like stop and really think about what that must be like. What like hearing and and you're living as a peer with people who are your parents, but they don't even know that. Like what kind of a mind fuck is that? You can't tell them you're going to sound like a motherfucking lunatic. And you can't talk to your younger self because what are you even going to say? Like, there's no way to prevent this from happening, I guess. Or maybe he knows why it happened and doesn't try to prevent it. That's really the thing that keeps coming to mind for me is that now that we know who he is, it's not like he made an effort that we saw to keep Mikhail from going into the woods that day. He doesn't try and change what happened. He kills himself a couple days before. And exactly why did he choose to do that? Is that something that he has to do now that he's like in on this big weird secret? Is there some sort of like ritual that they have to follow? Did he just crack under the pressure of what was going on and knowing that this date was coming and not wanting to like relive that mentally knowing what was happening to his other self. Can they not coexist once the lines get recrossed again? No idea, but I am wrapped up in the life of Jonas's father as a man living in a town where he is two people. That's just insanity. Um, But anyway, yeah, his mother is just really unhelpful. She's just like, yeah, he was different. You never knew whether he took something seriously or not. And Jonas looks like he's going to try and say something to her or ask her something. And then he looks at her and it seems like it sort of comes over him that he knows 
talking to her about this is pointless. Like there's just a look in his eyes of knowing both that it's going to sound nuts. And his mother is not exactly present in the way that she would have to be to hear this. And I really think there's also, I don't know if this is something that Jonas would say that he'd be able to quantify, but also like the feeling of her. She does not seem to have loved his father the way that she can't. She's obsessed with Ulrich, right? Obsessed. So, the way that she feels about his father could not compare to that. And her energy is not, it's easy to look at the way she's living now, chain smoking and ragged and not leaving the house and think that's a result of her fa- or of her husband's suicide. But we know that it's a result of Ulrich pulling away and feeling like devastated by a breakup that definitely means more to her than his father, it feels to me. And I think he doesn't know about her affair necessarily, or maybe he suspects, but he definitely knows that she's not that invested in his father. I think he senses it. And so talking to her about this just feels like there's not really anything to be gained from it. So then we go to Ulrich, who starts looking through the files of the about the disappearance of his brother. And it's really interesting to see him starting to put the pieces together. I would like to restate that I find Ulrich stupid sexy and it's very annoying because he's kind of a douche, but Lord. Um, And he listens to a recording where his mother is being questioned about the whereabouts of her, her rest of her family and her husband when her son disappeared and he notices that his mother says that their father was home, but he remembers that his father was not home. He knows that. I mean, how many times has he thought over what happened that day, you know? So eventually he goes to speak to her and he comes, uh, he come gets to the house when she is asleep and his father is awake and he demands of his father to know like, what the fuck, where were you? And first his father tries to be like, Oh really? What you suspect me now? But then it turns into more of a, like it's a, the, the confrontation too is really intense because I would remind you that Ulrich has like two black eyes, basically like he's got, it's not like black eyes, like he got beat up, but he has sunken. It is. He has a look on his face of somebody who hasn't slept in like three days and he has the cut over one eye. He looks very dangerous. And when he starts to confront his dad and his dad tries to be like, I can't believe that you would even think that of me. Ulrich kind of snaps and grabs him by the face And it's just like, first of all, shut the fuck up. Second of all, I know you weren't here. And I want to know where the fuck you were on the night that Mikkel disappeared. And his father is not answering. And his mother steps in and says he was here. Where else would he have been? And he gives Ulrich a look, like holds his eyes in eye contact as he grabs his coat and leaves. And this is the thing. She tells Ulrich the truth about that night and knowing that he was having an affair and covering for him because of that. But she doesn't tell him the truth about him not being home when Mads disappeared or when Mikkel disappeared. Um, So what's the deal, lady? What's happening here? You know, you know, something's up. And maybe you don't think that your husband did it, but you really should tell your son the fucking truth. Like, come on. Um, And we find out, I didn't realize this, but Regina is the granddaughter of the chief of police at the time of uh, Mad's disappearance. So 
he wasn't doing a totally thorough investigation because he knew if he pressed too hard, his daughter's affair would be revealed. It's assumed that like he knew what was going on. And that is very interesting to me, that little like extra bit of information. I don't know if that's going to add up to very much, but I'm extremely interested. Um, excuse me. I just keep sneezing today. I sneezed like twice, 30 times during the previous one. Um, and she's talking to Ulrich at one point about how him and his brother used to fight all the time. And she talks about, um, you know, the fact that he got a cut on his chin at one point, And that winds up playing into things later with him being able to positively identify the body. Um, yeah, but she and she says, did you know that I wanted to leave your father before it all happened? He was having an affair. Um, it wasn't the first one. And obviously, I want to remind everybody. Ulrich's been having an affair and he is seeing some reflections here that I think don't please him. There is nothing quite like repeating the patterns of your parents and not even realizing you've done it until somebody points things out later and you realize that like you, it is upsetting. And when she tells him this, you can see the look on his face shift a little bit. Uh, and it's like, there's definitely some self-loathing going on there. And she says, and the night Mads disappeared, he was with her. Um, while your brother disappeared, he was sleeping with another woman. And again, Ulrich's face, you know, did you know who she was? And she does, she does Claudia, um, Egon's daughter. So yeah, the whole thing is a whole mess. And the last person that actually saw Mads that evening was Regina, Claudia's daughter. But again, Egon did not want to push it too much. And he's realizing that Knight was like maybe linked up with what happened to Regina in the woods. So eventually he goes and talks with her. In the meantime, before we actually have that confrontation, we see her uh, trying to call her husband. She reached, she only gets a voice message. And later on, she opens a, an envelope that she got with results of her, uh, she had a mammogram. And obviously the news is bad. I feel like this has to be linked to whatever happened to her. Um, I don't, I think that this cancer is supposed to be like, there's too much thematically in this show about nuclear power and Chernobyl and acid rain or radio, radioactive rain. And the fact that she has cancer and that she was like out there in the woods, it feels linked to me, but I don't know. We'll see. And I think because there's an actual like sort of tender moment later between her and her husband on the phone. Where Alexander is like, I'm here for you. You know that, right? Like, I love you. And it's surprising because he has just seemed like such a cold hearted bastard that him being this sweet and genuine with her is really like pleasantly surprising, but also made me suspicious. And I can't help but wonder if he doesn't know what happened to her and feels a little guilty, like because he's obviously been covering something up there, you know, and I don't know what it is. I don't know if she's explained to him what happened to her when she was younger and like tied up in the woods. And if he has put two and two together about what's going on. But I, I really feel like there might be a part of him that feels responsible. And that's why it has softened him the way that it has. Now, that might not be a factor at all. Maybe he is a man who cares enough about his wife that when she gets cancer, he actually gives a shit. But he just didn't feel like that guy to me. So it's, I don't know. I'm, I'm reserving judgment on that, but we will see. Um, so 
Ulrich goes to speak to Regina, and this is when we get the big confrontation. She is looking at him with this expression on her face of, it's not just hatred, it's fear, it's loathing, it's a kind of revulsion that feels bone deep. She wants this man wiped off the face of Earth, like you can tell. And he asks her, what the fuck happened the night his brother went missing? And she is like, oh, that was a really long time ago. Why are you asking me about this? And he's like pressing her. Like, did he say anything? Did he do anything? Did you see anything? Like what happened? And he asks her, did you know that your mother and my father were having an affair? And she kind of gets a almost a relieved look like she I don't know if she thought he knew this whole time um but it's clear that she's been holding that for a bit and maybe didn't want him to know but there it is there's something that kind of connects the two of them um and she says Mads was the only person I knew who never said a bad word about anyone and I always asked myself, why him? It should have been you that it happened to instead of him. But there's no justice in this world, so... And then continues on with, and if the absurd thing is, had it not been for you and Katharina, maybe Mads wouldn't have disappeared. Mads knew I was afraid to walk home alone because of you two, because of what you did to me. So he wouldn't have gone with me and returned through the forest and the whole thing would never have happened. And he tries to be like, what happened was a game. We were children. We all made mistakes. And you says, and you still never apologized for it. And he is like, Oh, so that what's, that's what it's about that. You still see yourself as a victim and then says, you told your grandpa that I raped Katharina and you see her expression. This actress is really good. Like, I love her, honestly, as this character. She is really on point. And she's like, oh, my God, you thought I did that? And he you see his like expression get really cloudy. Like he really thought he had something. He had a Trump card that he could throw down and shame her with it and make her feel like shit. And she's kind of laughing at him. And he says, Hannah saw you turn me in to which she's like, so what? She followed me to the police station. Is that what happened? She watched me walk into the office. Like I don't understand how you think that Hannah, who was so in love with you, she would have done anything, would tell you the truth about this sort of thing. And she says, I'm not half as bad as you are. Now, this changed because when I was first watching this, I assumed that her being tied to the tree happened the same night that Mads disappeared. But we're supposed to, you know, this informs us that that happened probably a couple days earlier, maybe, maybe longer, who knows. But him saying we were children. Yeah, technically. But like, this is a really shitty thing to do to somebody. And I, they were old enough for sure to know better. And I don't. I want to know why they did it. Were they just bullies? Did they just not like Regina and they just decided to pick on her because they didn't like her? Was this retaliation for something else? It feels like it was just bullying. Like the way that we see her in the past as a kid interacting with the world and how withdrawn she is and everything. It feels like she struggled socially. So I could see them zeroing in on her as a target. And I understand him being like, seriously, you're still waiting for an apology about that 30 years later, 
because there is a point where you you feel like people should have let go of things. But I, if I were her, would absolutely also be waiting because you live in the same town as these people. This isn't something that like you have been waiting for an apology, even though you've moved across the country and moved on with your life. And when you see them again, you're like, I can't believe you never apologized. This is somebody that you grew up and started your own fam. They started their own family, at least. And you are meant to just sort of have let it go. And I think it's interesting that even when he finds out that it was actually Hannah that turned him in, he doesn't go back and apologize to her. I hope he does. But it seems like he's low key, like acting like the fact that he was turned. I don't know if like what order things happened in. But I think that this tying her to the tree in his mind was retaliation for her turning him in. I think that his arrest might have happened before this. So he was trying to get back at her for setting him up. And that's was in his mind retribution and now he knows in her mind she didn't know why this was happening to her there was no good reason he just chose to like pounce on her one day and do this to her and doesn't have any reason why she didn't know obviously until this moment you can see in her eyes that he thought she was the one who turned him in she had no idea that he was like laboring under that delusion so for her whole life she's been assuming that they just decided to fuck with her for fun when they saw it as revenge for a false report of rape, which, frankly, if it had been her that turned them in and this was all they did was tie her to a tree in the woods at night, that would feel pretty fair to me. Accusing somebody of rape falsely is really horrifying. So I wouldn't even be that mad about it. And I wonder what order things actually happened in, if that's correct or not. But I don't know if that does anything to sort of ease her mind to understand why, if that is what they thought they were doing, does that make her feel better or not at this point in her life? Does that even matter? You know? Um, but yeah, the confrontation, like you can see how emotional it was for her she closes her eye after he walks her, her eyes after she, he walks away and there is a single tear that falls um and Ulrich goes to the police station and he checks the records and sure enough Hannah's name is the one that was on the report and he goes to her house and you can see that like when he turns up at the door she is initially sort of glad and excited and interested that he has come to her house. But it becomes really clear that this is not what she thought. He asks, what do you want from me? And grabs her by the throat and holds her up against the wall and is like, you are the fucking one. What is wrong with you? And he asks, are you trying to ruin my life? Like, what is it that you want? And she says, you, which clearly, obviously, I mean, yeah, he doesn't understand. She is obsessed with him. Oh, B S E S S E D. Is that how you spell that? Um, yeah, but he's like, you're actually poison. And then says, how did your husband put up with it for so long? No wonder he couldn't take it anymore in the end, which is a very fucked up thing to say. Like, I'm not defending him. I think slapping him was totally justified here. However, I can't help but think there is an element of that in terms of why Jonas didn't tell his mother stuff. I think he can tell something isn't quite good with her. Like, and I don't know how much that fed into her marriage, but it's hard to have a normal marriage considering the life that he was coming from, you know? So who knows? Anyway, yeah. He just looks at her like he low-key wants to kill her. And they're in the house alone. And I think she realizes he could. 
he could do it. And, you know, it's not like he wouldn't get caught, but it, it would be done. It would be over. She'd be dead. So, yeah. And he's just looking at her and he's like, well, I really thought I knew who you were, but she goes to show I don't know jack shit. And this is just kind of what's going on in his life in general in this episode is just finding out over and over that people aren't who he thought. His mother lied to police and wanted to leave his dad. He had no idea. His dad was having this whole affair. He had no idea. This woman is setting him up. He had no idea. All of this stuff about people very close to him that he thought he knew and didn't at all. And I think that's something that like is really the theme of this episode is the way that we can exist with like a family that we think we are fully versed in everything about them because we share a roof with them. We're around them at like every second of the day that we're not out. And yet there is so much that you don't know. And this is something that like, as you get older, you really start to realize even more than ever, especially the way that like, Like, for example, with my father passing away, I realized that I really should have asked more questions because I didn't know what happened to him. And you lose your chance if you don't do it. And sometimes it's hard for people to talk about stuff. So that you there's also that where I like didn't ask questions because I knew to a point that it was just painful for him. But sometimes now I wish that I had done it, that I had just you know, kind of pushed through his discomfort and been like, no, seriously, like, talk to me. You're my father. Tell me what happened. Um, and that gets revealed, you know, to um, Katharina's children a little bit later on. So let's back up a bit and talk about Katharina because she gets in a confrontation with her daughter. And it's an interesting moment to me that she is so angry at her daughter the way that she is it's not like you know her son is out doing god knows what dicking around and it doesn't seem to bother her that he's out here just like uh, I, I just not home i guess is really the thing because that's what it feels like she wants her daughter to do um It feels like she wants to get Martha to stay with her by her side, waiting to hear news about Mikkel. And it feels like that's because she's a girl. And Magnus, meanwhile, can just wander the fuck around and do whatever. And she doesn't seem to expect that of him at all. So Martha is still doing this play and her mother just seems disgusted that she would continue on with this when her brother has only been missing for four days and says that she had thought it would was canceled. Martha tells her that the teacher thought it would be good to give people a break so that they can think about something else. And Katharina is basically like, Oh, cool. So everybody is just thinking of themselves. Awesome. We're just going to be super selfish here. Basically, essentially calling Martha selfish for participating in this. And Martha has had it. And she goes up to her mother and is like, are you going to keep putting up these fucking flyers? Do you think people don't know that he's missing? Do you think they don't see his face everywhere? You are out, out here Like, you haven't thought about how we're doing at all. And you expect him to just walk back through the door like nothing happened. He's fucking dead. And she says that and her mom slaps her. And she's just like, yeah, all right. Bye. I'm done. And leaves. And I have to agree with Martha on this, that it's not even like I blame her mother because her mother is going through one of the worst things in the world. It's, she's not wrong, though, at the same time. You know, like Christina or um, Katerina. I keep wanting to call her Christina. Katerina is having 
a bad time and is not really doing well with it. But it's a combination of like, not only this, but also like figuring out that her husband is having an affair and feeling very alone because of that. So I think her lashing out and calling her daughter selfish, like everybody's thinking of themselves. I think that's rooted more in what's going on with her husband even. And she's just lashing out at her kid because she feels like that is my daughter. And I should at least be able to depend on my kids giving a shit about each other. And Magnus comes up to his mother and hugs her after and really has a look on his face. Like he has a lot of sympathy for her, but there's a feel to it also that makes me think she's much closer to Magnus than she is to her daughter. It feels like they don't have a very good relationship. And Magnus is the oldest as well. And I feel like that's significant. I have, I don't have siblings, so I can't attest to this for sure, but I think that older kids tend to become a bit of a caretaker with parents sometimes. And that might be part of what's going on here. Um, so Moving on to what happens a little bit later, I'm going to just talk about, um, I just, guys, this whole, like, (sighs) this whole thing with whatever it is going on between Magnus and, uh, what is her name? The young girl, um, Francisca, right? I don't know what to make of it. I've got to be honest here. Um, because he had followed her last time in the woods when she like retrieved money from under a train track and like sort of got confrontational with her about where she was making her money. And then they wind up having sex in the locker room. He follows out this time to the same spot and he comes across like a pretty grody mattress that's just sitting out in the woods and there's some used condoms next to it and a necklace. And I think that necklace is something that she was wearing because of the expression on his face when he finds it. But I have to be honest, I don't remember it. This didn't mean anything to me. It seems to mean something to him. Um, And I guess the assumption that he is making here and that we are meant to make is that she's turning tricks in the woods to make this money. And it, we don't actually see any sort of like conclusion to this, but I don't know what to make of it in terms of what he is thinking or what she is doing like it's weird how she responds to him in the previous episode the fact that they had sex the way they did is just strange to me in general and I just don't like I feel like there is supposed to be something here that I'm like seeing and I'm not um and and he you know when he and his sister wind up both in his like twin bed later talking. Um, She's bringing up the fact that like, you feel like, you know, people and you don't. And he seems to commiserate, but he knew that she was like making money on the side and figures that she's selling drugs. And so it seems to him like the fact that she's turning tricks is like one bridge too far, like dealing drugs wouldn't have been great, but he'd have understood it. But this he can't deal with, which feels on brand for dudes, to be honest. Um, And also maybe there's a bit of him that's like irritated about it because knowing that she is sleeping with other people, whether for money or not, when he just slept with her, there's like just a proprietary sort of possessiveness about that, that he might be like falling victim to. Um, But, you know, I don't know. There's something about the two of them that feels like, I don't know if it's just that it feels undeveloped or if it's, I I feel like I'm supposed to be more interested than I am. And I don't really care. Um, 
so okay we'll talk about this like very interesting cut between what's going on with Jonas because he is going out into the woods and he is going to fucking follow this map um follow the signal it said on the map was the thing that he really noticed and there was like somebody left a uh little noose made out of red cord on his bike um and we are cutting between that him traveling through the tunnels in the cave and the play and we have Bartos coming in and speaking to Martha Bartos is one of those guys that I feel like a little bad for because he really is trying his best, but he is not good at communication or sensing what Martha's feeling. So it's frustrating to watch because he is being really fucking dense. This girl's brother is missing. She's going through hell and he just does not seem to really understand the tumult of that and is being a little bit selfish about sort of expecting her to be available to him the way that she would normally be. Um, even though she's going through something that he can't even imagine. And he's trying He's trying his best. Like, he's saying he's apologizing. He's like, I'm the one that said that we should go to the caves and it's my fault. And I think that he actually does think that, actually. But he turns it into, are you angry with me? Rather, you know, like, I, and is worried about himself. And when she says that she's not angry, he tries to kiss her again. And she's like, pulls away and walks away and it's just like you know I just don't really have time for this right now and he asks her if she wants to run away with him and I was just like dude what are you doing like he just doesn't know what to do you know so it's not he's not a bad guy but he's just really like you know he's not good at this part and I, I feel for him a little bit because when you're not good at this and you are making an effort, it can feel really like infuriating on your end because you think you're, tr you're doing well by at least trying and this person is not responding, but she's under no obligation to respond the way that you need her to, dude. She's got her own shit going on. Really, it's just that he's very young, you know? And they're not equipped for this emotionally. And um, he had tried to make a deal earlier with Jonas to, uh, and this was in the previous episode when he runs across Noah, to meet up somewhere so that he could try and get his hands on some supply. And he asks her if she's seen Jonas. And she says that she hasn't, even though she definitely did and kissed him. And there was a whole thing. Um and he goes out into the audience and she's standing there feeling obviously pretty guilty about the whole thing. Um, so we cut from them to Jonas going into the cave and there's like the police line, do not cross, which he goes ahead and crosses anyway. And this is intercut with a few other things. We go to, for example, um, Katharina, who looks at the phone records and sees that her husband has called the same number a bunch of times and she calls it and lo and behold, it's Hannah who picks up. Um, and you know, we see the, uh, we see what's her face, uh, Regina and you know, she's at her desk and this is when Ulrich comes in and then we cut back to Hannah and she is calling into a radio show and they're talking about what's going on in Winden and the fact that things are just like, you know, really um, up in the air that there's no answers. And she calls and essentially it's just like, we are living with a murderer. There is somebody in this town. We keep thinking it's not going to happen to us. Nobody wants to say that these kids are dead, but we know better. 
and it's we just don't know each other and there is like a wound in this town there is something wrong with us and we're all just too fucking chicken shit to talk about the fact and that this town is sick and as she's saying this we see like you know that regina is listening to the radio and is hearing this and really fucking feels a way about it um and that leads to a confrontation a little bit later so we go to the play and we have this like narrator who is talking about how um we're about to see Minas's daughter, who's the sister of the Minotaur, the half sister, I guess. And that she has told Theseus where her brother is and where, how to kill him in exchange for the promise of him being able to be with her forever is how the like actual myth goes, right? Is that she is get, she will marry him in exchange for killing the Minotaur, who is her brother, which is yikes. Um, and she has her monologue and that is intercut with what's going on with Jonas going through the caves and also what's going on with fucking, um, oh my God, what's his name? Um, Tronte, who is down in the, uh, that like bunker area with Charlotte's husband um, or not Hel is he Helge? Yeah. Helge. Right. Cause Tronte is the other one. Um, what is her husband's name though? I can't remember. Um, do, do, do I'm trying to find Peter? I always forget his name. Thank you, Michael. Um, but yeah, they're down there and they're checking their, like they have like a fucking, spreadsheet and they're checking their watch um and it says and and when jonas gets to the cave there's a red cord that is allowing him to follow it to where he needs to go so this is very much lining up with like the whole minotaur in the uh labyrinth sort of imagery that's going on at the play um but yeah, Peter being down here, checking his watch, 19 minutes until 917. And this guy, like having this book in his hands where they're, they're double checking dates and things like what in the fuck is going on here? They know Jonas is about to cross over. What does that mean? Why are they doing this? Why are they participating in this? Um... And we get the monologue from Martha and she's saying, I have not eaten in days. My eyes are turning black just as he once descended into the maze. Now I descend into mine and changes out of her white dress into a black dress that she's wearing underneath. Um, and then continues on with essentially a monologue about being alone and having committed, you know, some sins and going into death and everybody being in the end alone when they go into death. And as she's saying this, Jonas comes across this doorway that has the title of the episode, Sic Mundus Creatus Est, on the door with like one of the, um, the Celtic knots. And he opens it and there is so much wind like pushing back on him. And it is a really intense moment of just like, you know, we are aware that there are other people out there who know what he's doing at this time, waiting for this to happen. And there's something about that, that I just hate like him being part of a thing and not knowing it. Um, and on stage, She's talking about being a loose end in time, um, which felt very significant to me and kneels down and says, and so we all die alike, whether I 
um, no matter into which house we are born, no matter which gown, um, whether we grace the earth briefly or for a long time. And it's clear that as she's saying this, she's like coming to terms with some shit alone on the stage in front of everybody. Um, I alone tie my bonds, whether I have extended hands or slapped them. And as she says that the camera focuses on her mom and her mom has a very contrite expression on her face. Um, and she sort of breaks down and finally her mother like runs up on stage and holds her. And as we're going out into like, she, she, eventually takes her off the stage and like they're on stage hugging each other when the lights begin to go on and off because Jonas has gone through that doorway and whatever it was has activated this like charge that affects everything. Even Charlotte's car headlights are flickering on and off. Like this isn't just like an electrical grid thing there is something in the air, like an electrical magnetic pulse. Um, meanwhile, underground, Peter and what's his face are checking this fucking list of times. And they know precisely what time they're like. And, and it's one of a list in which another one is coming. Um, and I need to like probably pause this and like look at that a little bit more closely to see when like future dates are, but it seems that they know what's happening here. So <laughs> there we have Katharina walking out with Martha and they've sort of seemed to have like passed whatever blockage was causing them to headbutt each other essentially things seem to be good and as they're leaving regina is like it just can't resist is the play over already or did you drag your daughter off stage to sa save her from the sick people in this town if you can't stand living here why don't you just leave and she's like pursuing her walking up behind her saying this stuff to a woman whose son has just vanished like what are you thinking what are you trying to get out of this regina you know and in a moment of deep gut satisfaction visceral yes i had like i was just like really happy katharina turns around and pops that woman in the face and keeps beating on her. Even after she goes down, she's like continuing to hit her. And honestly, I'm not really that mad about it. Like, should she have done that? No, honestly, I would have been fine with her hitting her once or twice. And then she goes down and then you stop. But I'm not really going to like try and judge her for this because that was so far beyond what is okay. Like Regina, what are you fucking thinking? I just really and acting like, why don't you just leave? Her son just vanished. Why would she leave? What are you talking? Of course, she thinks the, the town is sick. Somebody amongst you has taken her son. She thinks like, what the fuck is? Of course, she feels this way. And you know what? You also feel this way, Regina. Don't even pretend it was so like gross and and. Again, with the, like, Ulrich said something last time about, oh, is that how you see yourself as the victim? Yeah, apparently he was kind of dead on. He does. Like, she does think that. And when she stands up after the lights, like, steady and everything, um, because Magnus finally comes and, like, drags his mother off her. Uh, she stands up and is like, yeah, well, that's who your mother is. Why don't you tell them what happened back then? Tell them who your mother really is, who their mother really is. And I'm like, girl, you brought this shit on yourself, first of all. And second of all, unless the timing that I think is wrong, 
unless they tied you to a tree just to bully you and not because they thought you had turned in Ulrich, then what they did is really not that big a deal. But it, there might be way more to that than I know about. So I'm trying to, again, reserve judgment here. And we end. I already talked about Ulrich realizing that the body is his brother's. So I'll just talk about Jonas, who walks out into 1986 and realizes that he's like fucking time traveled and is looking absolutely bewil like he just doesn't know what to do. I think he thought. I, I don't know what he thought when he went into the caves, to be honest. I don't know if he believed what he read about his father. But it I don't like it just he like there's no way that you experience time travel and don't have this sort of reaction, whether you know it's coming or not. Right. And uh, when he runs across Hannah and they offer to give him a ride home, he just completely freaks out and starts to, you know, so now I'm wondering is is there more than one version of him because he went back in time and he was older so is the the guy that's sitting downstairs that's like reading the times off the chart is that him could it be but i don't really know like whether he is able to come back or how any of this goes down like What's it? Helge Doppler. That's the one. I don't think that's him, though, because he there is like a image of him from being a child and he doesn't look like. So I don't know. Can he go back and forth? I just I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's happening. So I'm going to wrap this up. But this is a really, really good episode. Um, I'm I am just here for revelations of secrets. You know, it's hard to not get excited about that sort of thing. Um, so let's see, we have, uh, let's say the sixth. So the next episode is on October 15th. But, and so there's a bit of a gap. But after that, we have four pretty consistently um, throughout November. So thank you guys very much for all commissioning those episodes. I really appreciate it because I am dying and I cannot wait to find out what's next. Um, so thank you again, Jill, for commissioning this and starting us off on this. And thank you to everybody else who commissioned and are helping me continue on with this. And I will be seeing you in October with a new episode. Until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.